Thank you everybody for coming to Carolina Con. Uh, we're really glad to have you here. Uh, this talk I'd like to try and make uh, as interactive as um, you would all be willing to help me with that. There's things that are going to be, we're going to be talking about, that you guys are going to know some things that I'm not going to know, and I'd like you to volunteer that for the whole group. And um, if we can get a little back and forth going here with uh, some different things that people know and we can exchange, I think that would be wonderful. So please throw up a hand. I'm going to try and pause every once in a while, ask for questions, and uh, uh, please, please contribute. For the interactors, are you actually going to have feds come in here and seize our volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting, um, interesting thing because that's what I'd like to talk about. You get to work. Monday, and your computer is not on your desk. If you got a work laptop, and for some reason you left it there, or what have you, or you yeah, basically your computer is gone, and you can assume it's imaged, and that law enforcement has a bit-for-bit bit copy of everything that's ever been on your drive. And uh, that's, the, that's the thing that is really kind of scary to probably some people, um, hopefully not too many people, but been there. things do happen to people. People do things that they shouldn't do on computers that aren't necessarily theirs, and uh, the cops could basically walk into your workplace or your home at any point and say they've got a warrant or say they've got some kind of bullshit excuse for seizing your machine and uh, they've got the state behind them so that's that's where that's what, what what the situation is hopefully that never happens to you but um, some questions might come up like you know why the heck is this happening to me um, it could be your employer has done something uh, that is not necessarily legitimate, that may be fine, but somebody wants to investigate it. So your uh, an investigator comes in and you know has all the, the com computers at the your, your workplace taken. Um, maybe you personally, uh, say an ex-wife, an ex-husband, somebody who doesn't like you, decides that they want to point the finger at you and say you're doing something bad. And who are you to say until it's gone? Somebody, all they need is a warrant, and your, your machine's gone. It could be somebody could be at your house right now, while you're here, uh, season the damn thing, and taking it away. Um, somebody that sucks. just somebody just wants to seek revenge. You know, they can point the finger and you say child porn. I saw him. I heard him talking about blah blah blah, and that's a red flag to anybody. And it's a good enough reason for a lot of employers to tell the cops, come on in, do whatever you need to do, take it away. Um, could be simple mis misunderstanding. Somebody thought they heard something and it was perfectly legit and somebody said something and whatever. But uh, it's really easy to have happen and once it's, you know, once the event has occurred, you're, um, you don't have much, much that you can do. So if this ever does happen to you, which I hope it never does, what you need to be really careful about, if you don't want to end up in jail, um, and not to say that anyone here is doing anything illegal, but a lot of times there's something that you can be prosecuted for, no matter how legitimate or white hat or whatever you think you are. Um, so if you are spoken to, I advise you to say as little as possible and find yourself a lawyer because it's a good chance that lawyer is going to come in handy in the coming days and weeks. Um, even if you can get your machine back, there's a chance it's been imaged, which means bit for bit, every little piece on your hard drive that um, has really ever been there, either if it's from you or the you know Jones down the hall that had your machine before it was transferred to you. His data could be on there, and basically it's yours, and who knows what's the difference. If you can't find an, an you know, clear from misunderstanding with your employer, within a very short period of time, finding somebody to talk to that has knowledge of the legal system would be advised. Yes? 
Is there any special type of lawyers or anything you want to look up in the telephone book or something? Jennifer Granick. Let me know more about that. You can suggest something. I don't. Jennifer Granick. Jennifer Granick. Yeah. Okay, she's the person who talks about yes. Um. So, basically, don't say much. Don't try and. I mean, go ahead and try and say, you know, this was a misunderstanding and try and get your machine back and try and get your boss or whatever to try and drop the case. But if that doesn't happen like that and you get your machine back before anybody's touched it, um, could be in could be in a situation. So, what happens when the investigator gets the uh, gets the machine? Basically they're after the hard drive. And these are the these are the following basic steps that uh, a, a computer forensic, you know, computer crime forensic expert is going to go through. They're going to assess the situation, look at your case, look at what the situation is, and first try and get a picture and decide how to proceed based on the case. And what they're going to do is they're going to go and acquire everything they can related to that case. They're going to try and get. Um, I'll go into it in the next slide or whatever. But they're going to try and basically capture a moment in time of you and your computer and what you're doing and what was on it, such, such, such. The next step is to take all that evidence and go through a complete examination. What they're going to do is try and pull apart the bits on the disk, go to the file system level and extract pieces of data that they find that they feel are interesting to your case, things that might be pertinent in a courtroom, such, such, such. They're going to try and take out information and make it meaningful to a court of law, a judge, a, another computer crime expert, a child pornography prosecutor, whatever. Um, and then they're going to try and, you know, these steps overlap a little bit, but they're going to try and document all that stuff and write it down and interpret all the raw not raw data, but all, interpret all the analysis they've done and kind of simplify it and make it in, you know, put it in a form that they can, they can take to court and present to a judge or whatever. Uh, so going back to the topic, I'm going to talk about the, the assessment part. What is your case about? But again, they're going to try and, uh, they're going to interview the people that may have said that Joe or Jane is doing this or that and do interviews and talk to your boss or if it doesn't have anything to do with you they're going to examine the case against the business. Uh, is this business using you know pirated software stuff they haven't paid for? Are they dealing with you know financial funny business? Are they trying to get away with things? Are they trying to store things that they shouldn't be storing? Such, 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 stuff like that. Um, the evidence gathering is a obviously very important part of the process because if they screw up here, the whole rest of their case falls apart. So the people that are going to be doing this hopefully are doing it in a very professional manner where everything is written down. Obviously, we know about the OJ trial and like you know how you can contaminate a crime scene, and that's really really easy to do, especially the computer system. Since the computer system is so volatile. When it's on, everything's stored in memory. As soon as it turns off, you basically flash into the ether a lot of really worthwhile stuff, especially if somebody who may be criminal or involved in things they shouldn't be involved in has past phrases on protected disk areas. That's something that you're going to want to have in memory and not go away with a power switch. So if you're ever asked to help out with a situation like this. There's just things that you should know about and things that are done so that if you're trying to catch a bad guy, you should do. And if you're trying to help somebody not be caught, you, sh you should know about. <laughs> they're going to not only capture the computer, but they're going to image the memory before they take the power. They're going to capture pertinent papers and effects around the desk. They may look in a coat if a coat is hanging on the hanger near the office space. They may look in drawers. They may, be, they may have the legal right to take pieces of paper, um, sticky notes, stuff like that. They look at the bottom of the keyboard. They're going to take 
manuals, any place where you may have written information that may be pertinent or may help them decode a passphrase or anything like that, they're going to want to get. And they do often have the legal, uh, legal right to do that. There will be some places where their right is not necessarily totally legit, like is my personal drawer on my desk where only personal things are, do they have the, you know, do they need a warrant to go in there and is that part of the case? So, Professor, I hope you will jump in if you see anything or can help in any way here. I'll, I'll say, if Please that's do. not part of the search and seizure warrant, if their search and seizure warrant says we have this machine, this Mac, this IP, that's what we are going to seize, that's all they can see. Okay, yeah. that's good. And if they do take something else, you can use that in court. Go ahead. Um, from what I understand also though, if they see other things that are incriminating they while they're fulfilling the search and seizure order, right. they're allowed yeah. to but how do you capture any of that. Yeah, like, like if they're doing an examination all of a sudden, it's, like say it's an examination with regards to kind of the truth, and as they're going through that machine all of a sudden, hey wait, that looks like child porn. They'll have to get a separate warrant to examine that. Like, it's not just that we can take whatever, whenever, however. And if you're really interested in this, if you think this is cool, if you think it's very interesting, there's now little laminated guides that can fit in your pocket that just about every single law enforcement agent should have. That's a best practices guide for search and seizure digital evidence that's created by the Secret Service and another group. And you can get them do for, for cheap or nothing, depending on how easily your, your Secret Service agents in your town handle. Created by the Secret Service. <clears throat> There are protections that you are afforded in that the warrant is specified for a certain place on your disk, a certain type of information they're looking for. But they are going to image the whole thing. And even though they shouldn't be looking at it, everything they've got, and who knows how much we can trust law enforcement, whatever. Go ahead. That's sort of a question. Hasn't this been Patriot Act deemed any sort of hacking as terrorism? And it, then it falls into a new criteria of laws? Don't know. I think uh, Patriot Act, you know, threw a whole bunch of protections we had out the window. So, I mean, like we can call anybody a terrorist and do whatever we want. Yeah, to. like, like black, black black terrorists that they can throw everything out that you guys are talking about and just look at whatever they want. Like, you're, you're not allowed to take a picture of railroads, even though there's all these railroad nuts out there. And take pictures of them. That's illegal power lines. It's and infrastructure. Yeah, so bridges. Yeah, so yeah, if you have a picture of that, they could use and that. They there's actually terrorists. a couple cases that the court right now about the legality of I'm not sure. I'm, we're not going to go into that right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, 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 and if, yeah, like I said, there's a lot of stuff that's being caught and it's being rolled. I mean, people are using it and, and it's, being, it's being recognized as being used. I mean, I don't think that was going to hold water this evening. It's been five years. What I'm trying to do is give you guys an overview and yeah, yeah, yeah. inform you about some of the issues that may come up. Seek your own lawyer, IANAL. But these are just some of the issues from 30,000 feet. This is an overview. I'm not trying to do anything other than that. Yeah, 99 times out of 100, you know, it's child porn that they're going after or some hacking activity. It's not a terrorist. Yeah, it's the what highest percentage. Any, well, what I was basically getting at is at what point do you absolutely have no rights whatsoever towards that? Or is there no point in this? If you're at the get low, then you're going to get screwed. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, so, uh, further into the acquisition, what they're going to do is um, they want to extract a, a, a moment in time image of, of your drive, generally, and they want to preserve the copy so that it will hold up in court. They want an exact, but basically what they don't want to do is work off of the raw drive that you had in your machine. What they do is they take a copy, bit for bit copy, DD image or whatever, and work on that. Do all the analysis on the copy so that if so that the original evidence is still around. Say you had an old drive, they don't want the thing to crap out, have to do the investigation, so they can't continue to find things, whatever. They're gonna protect uh, protect that from tampering by adding a, uh, a a right blocker. And basically what they're trying to do is preserve the evidence so that nobody wants nobody can throw it out in prosecution because some loophole. They want the evidence to be clean and good the whole way around. They don't want somebody to think that a prosecutor was trying to set anybody up by planting evidence. It can't happen. So there's this thing called a chain of custody. 
And along with every piece of information or material they gather, but primarily the hard drive, they're going to have to state uh, times and places of who had the drive or who had the image. So that if changes may have been made, we know exactly who had access to it. So that we can, in court, determine whether or not this guy was trustworthy or not. And if there's only two people that handled it ever, we know that those are the only two people that could have changed or planted, you know, pornographic images on your drive image or whatever. When they do the acquisition, what they're going to do is they're, this is a USB, um, USB type uh, imager, a uh, rate blocker. There's also those made for ATA and SCSI, such, such. But it's a hardware device that you insert between the physical drive that you have and the computer that you're copying the image onto. It allows no rights to be made to the drive. So normally if you hook up a computer to a drive, there's soft, you can do software protection, but basically you can write to the drive and you can disturb the evidence on there. This just makes sure that only data is going to one way and you're not changing anything on the drive once you hook it up to your own machine in the police station or investigation officer. There are uh, software based USB write blockers, but they won't hold up. Right. Um, if they work, but they won't hold up. If you find out that a write block was not used when they imaged, that's a good way to get your case thrown off. And I also hear that those USB Red blockers, if you ever try and use one of those, it's hard to get your USB port working again because yeah, they like yeah. overwrite yeah. stuff completely. Yeah. Go ahead, Professor. I was going to say, I'm glad you're mentioning all this because it's a lot easier for a prosecutor to attack the forensic analyst than it is the evidence. So they can say, oh, there's a problem with the change of evidence collection or what have you, than it is to say, well, that's not child porn. It's a lot easier to say, well, how do you find it? Well, you didn't follow the correct procedures or whatever. So, excellent job. So these are the things that are happening when they take the drive off to the police station. Um, like I said before, all the all the work that they want to do is going to be done on a copy of your drive. And so the there's a number of different uh, image programs. Um, DD is the old school classic. It's the old school Unix, bit for bit. I'm just moving bits through this pipe, you know, image and entire drive, you would do like it has in here. Uh, do on, on the, this is a network version of DD where you basically pipe the input, which is dev SDA, which is the entire first disk. Okay, there's some arguments here, no errors and sync, which basically means if the drive decides it doesn't have the bit all the way because it's a bad block or something, what DD normally will do is leave a hole in your data and by the time you get to the end of the disk the image will be shorter than the actual disk and it'll just write zeros in there. That can be a problem um, and if the drive doesn't want to work at all you really have a uh, problem. That's what um, if you go up, up uh, two lines the SCD, DD Rescue and some of these others are able to handle the errors a lot better and they will continue on and probably put zeros in there, but they don't, uh, they don't shorten the uh, image file that comes out. So back to the, the network version I'm describing, why you want to do it on the network is you don't want to try and image or copy onto the same machine, because as soon as you're copying data onto the drive that's on the same machine, you're affecting that machine. And you're affecting, and if, obviously you don't want to write to the same disk. If you ever want to try and take a disk image to try and uh, recover some data, you always want to put it onto another device because if you're putting it on the same disk and you're trying to recover undeleted files, you may write over those sectors that you're trying to recover. So this, uh, this network thing basically throws it through gzip to make it a little faster and then uh, you, you put it in the netcat which put it over the network. On a trusted PC which you can receive the data on, you run a netcat listener and then d un, un gzip or whatever, and then spit it out to a file. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually, um, I'll continue with this. You store it. You can you can also store it to an attached uh, attached drive. You stick in a USB or FireWire drive. And then what they want to do is they want to generate a hash of that image, so that you can validate that the copy is the same as the one that you captured. 
And also, when the analysis is done, you're going to check that the uh, hash value matches what you've been working with all along and what you captured at the beginning. If that doesn't match, basically, there's no way to prove, there's no way to say that you didn't have, uh, you didn't play this information or whatever. Go ahead. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, what are the currently accepted uh, hashing out of the third mental court due to the fact that there are maybe I'm not sure of that. I know MD5 and SHA1 have weaknesses. What I would do is if I was an investigator is get as many hash as I can. <laughs> because uh, you know, if you kind of double up a little bit, they're either all the same or they're all going to be all different. So that way you can you know, change one bit in one, hopefully be caught by one of the hashes. Um, let me see what I have up to this next slide here. Okay, there's, there's, there's obviously a bunch of tools that will do this imaging, and um, one of them is this, this one called uh, AIR. It's just a, basically, uh, a GUI in, uh, interface to uh, DD or the DCFLDD, which you can see through this uh, the red mark on the right side of the top box. Um, it's basically just a, a interface to that. I am going to show you one uh, tool that's called the FLK DD uh, or the FLK Imager application. FTK Imager. So this is one that comes from a commercial package. I think you can download it. The imager thing, I believe, is free. The uh, forensics package that it comes with is not. Basically, you could go here and create a disk image. You can either uh, image a physical drive, a logical drive, which would be like a partition, uh, or an image file, or you can just take the contents of the folder. But say, for example, I was going to try and image my entire machine here. Um, I don't have anywhere to put it right now, but uh, you know, it's, I would select the drive, 40 gig ID, and then you decide where to put it. And there's a couple different options here for the type of image uh, you can generate. The raw is just a straight bit for bit copy. I ended up with 40 gigs on the other end. Smart is a, um, a compressed image, and the ED E01 is the one from the end case. It's the end case format. So I would go with this price smart one because I think it allows me some uh, meta information along with it. So uh, in a lot of these forensic applications, you have um, options to put in case numbers and all kinds of uh, information about the specific case. So I'm just going to kind of fill this with junk for now so I can get to the next. Blah, blah, blah. And you can break this up into uh, different sized uh, Say I got 40 gigs and I don't have a 40 gig um, place to put it on the other end. Um, can, can I ask you guys a yeah. if you, you want to talk a little, outside, a little distracting? Uh, you can uh, change the compression, blah, blah, blah. And then it basically goes, just goes through and it's copying my disk now <coughs> bit for bit. I'm going to cancel that. I have a, um, a test image I'm going to be using for the rest of the presentation, which I'm going to start an analysis on. Because <coughs> it takes a little bit of time to uh, pick through the data. So I'm going to start in on a little bit of a forensic. Uh, Interpretation of an image so, that I have. So, are we going to be reading your private emails and stuff? And all that? No, nope. Look <laughs> so, that's the imager application. I also have this uh, forensic toolkit, which is a professional application that's used by uh, law enforcement. I Yes, NCASE is the big one that's uh, kind of the gold standard, I guess. We're actually more pushing FTK and the friends This is the assignment we're doing this week, oh, really? the weekend, for my friends' this class. Well, feel free to tell us more. 
we were given, um, she and the bathroom professor made it. He was going to do an 80 day damage. It took him too long to get it to work. So he had 20 days, big partitions, and stuff written in some partition space. Mm -hmm. And he gave us two weeks to make an image using DD Rescue and, and do an analysis using our choice of tool. He's really pushing the FTK. The, uh, the large images do generally take uh, a good bit of time. I do have a dumb question. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason that an image made with DD Rescue will not open in any case? It keeps telling me it's not a valid image type. I'm not sure. I, I haven't used it in case actually. One, one thing FTK has that NCASE doesn't is a database, a huge database of known file types and caches and other information on files. So um, you know, last night when I was talking steganography, if you're trying to hide stuff in any you know common files, uh, the FTK database will detect that the, the files don't match. Uh, on that subject, there was a talk at Hope about something similar to this, and one of the things that guy went over was determining file types despite what, like, he was showing different file types and the information they contained based on the hex data in them, and he was doing this graphical analysis of it, where you end up with what's sort of a, a bar graph, and different sections of the bar graph will line up with a specific file type, so you could have a JPEG with text in it, and it would show a JPEG file with sort of something like a curve or so, and then the text would be like a specific spike, and you could find it. So that, is that based on statistical analysis? Yeah. Of, yeah. It was really interesting stuff. I wish you could look at the utility of using it. So uh, what I have is I have a DD image file of a USB drive on my hard drive. And when you start up a case in uh, this FTK application, basically it asks you, you know, what do you want to do with the case? Because they're assuming that you're a police organization, whatever, or business is trying to figure things out. And you may, need, you may be working on a couple projects at once. So it allows you to separate out things, give things case numbers and whatever. Um, you can choose what you want to describe here. And then you can choose a number of different processes and form. I, yes, I want hashes. The KFF lookup, I don't have that file, but that's a known file filter, which um, you have uh, basically, you can get a database of uh, hashes or like recipes for what files look like that are known DLLs that are probably not going to be a big deal or any, are worthwhile to your investigation. So you can say, if it matches a KFF, don't worry about it. I don't care. It's just a Windows DLL. You know, it's nothing that it's nothing that, that will interest an investigator. Um, entry test, full index. I mean, these are basically just different options you can uh, use to further investigation that will just end up taking time. A data card is what um, you can. It'll pull out files even if they're not as part of the file system. So say you had a bitmap image on there, on your drive at one point, but you've since deleted it. Well, it comes out of the file system's index, and the name doesn't match anything anymore. But often, those bits will still be on the platter. you just kind of delinked it or whatever, or taken out of the FAT table, or told uh, NTFS to not worry about it anymore. Well, if the data carving says, I know what the top of a bitmap image looks like, and I know what the end looks like. So if I can find that information anywhere on the platter, Give me the hunk of data between that, and most likely all I have to need to do is attach a name to it, and I'll be able to see the bitmap again. So I can carve out that kind of stuff. Um, unconditionally add file slack. That's the data at the end of a file. So each file has uh, file systems use a cluster size. The files all must fit into. Um, multiples of that cluster size, if they don't completely fill a cluster, there's a little bit of room at the end that isn't used for anything. Well, you can store data in there, and your file system, will, you won't be able to necessarily see it through Explorer or you know the command line, but the data is on the platter. And with special tools, you can get into that slack space, slack space being the end of the cluster that you're not using for the file that you're trying to store in there. Um, so it will look through there, and um, I'm going to go with the defaults and the rest. File type criteria basically means if you find these things, just note them, documents, spreadsheets, whatever.
add evidence. Okay, so this is where I'm going to add the uh, acquired image of a drive. Which I'm going to find in right here. 128 megs of a test forensics image that you can play with to try and find stuff in that I downloaded and created myself. I apologize. Evans identification number. Somebody pick something. Okay, that's good. 600. <laughs> Okay, so already we can see that it's pulled out that I've got a couple different things going on in this key. I've got an NTFS partition, and then I've got something which, who knows what it is. I guess we'll have to dig into that later. Um, blah, 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 that's where I'm gonna store my thing. So what it does, current evidence item, current file item, what it's doing is going through there and trying to index all the things that it finds. See, it's finding different um, graphics file types, tells me what their size is, each progress, you know, it doesn't take too long for each one. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to let that run in the background. We're going to go back to the presentation. So it's going to index that uh, 128 megs of uh, USB key that we have. It doesn't slow me up too much. Can everybody hear me okay? Any questions? Anybody want to add anything? 15 um, minutes. I'll add something. Okay. You know, if, if you're doing this as a job or as you know, some assignment, you know, we talked about it, but basically when you get that drive, if it's not a drive you see, I don't go around and see some drives, but other given drives that you're directed on. And basically, you have to note that box has been received, signed for, it is unopened, untampered with. You have to, you know, I open it at this time. I you know, refresh my, my forensics machine, I use this right blocker, I use this tool, this time I started doing this with this drive, and you have to record every step you're doing if you expect this to uh, hold any water, right. if that has to go to court. It's Watch all pretty apps. easy to pet ball parts if you don't do everything exactly right. Just an end note if you're doing it for a company. Louder, please. Uh, just an added note if you're doing it for a company, you want to make sure you follow all the policies that are on the door or in your spaces. They say no drinks in there. When you bring a drink in, that will uh, destroy the case too. But it just shows that you're not following the rules and policies set by the company. And a lot of times they will say, we have the right to monitor your stuff. And basically if they say that, they can walk in at any time and and take your thing. They can watch all your network traffic. And if you're doing it for a company, um, and you know it's a case involving something like porn, you've got to have a secure area to do it. Because if you're reviewing evidence, and it's some porn videos, and some coworker walks in, it's not good. Because that worker is going to say, this is looking at porn, he exposed to the porn, and you know, you've got other problems after that. But even though you were doing it as a job, what you want to do if you're doing that kind of analysis is do it in a private area. Because you're going through all the guys' private stuff. Yes. The company I work for, we're not authorized to read emails, but we have something that's called a dirty words list. If you type in certain words through your email, the whole flag will trigger. Yeah, but if, you're doing <laughs> this, if you're doing this, you're going to retrieve the emails that they've done through Hotmail, through Outlook, through whatever. You know? This is this is a set aside policy. Yeah, it's got the you have to look through it if you're gathering evidence and putting together a case. And I that just, sucks if you're a guy like me who doesn't like digging in other people's So what's the point of that? You have permission to do it. They have permission to investigate further. Yes. However, a company, I mean, if you want to look at the policy, this is three inches of policy on what they can and can't do. And if they want to, if you're holding your floppy drive and even your the desk that's owned by that company, they can go in there. Yep. Now, this can bring in your own personal filing cabinet. Right. If okay. that, that property is owned by the company, they can do it. Your yep. locker. Uh, go ahead. Um, uh, it's just an ad note, as most people know. I mean, everything you type in the email, you just type it in and delete it, and you scrub it with a yep. third party software, Word document. It's and even scrubbing, even though scrubbing utilities won't get your Slack space, and even if you scrub it seven times, there are still ways on low density drives that it can be recovered. There's magnetic force mes mes microscopy, 
which I mean you can recover back, you know, up to probably seven to ten writes through some fancy analysis, but it, it is possible. Um, going back to the analysis, what the what somebody's going to do with the disk image? I only have like 10, 15 minutes left. They're going to do a partition structure. They're going to basically look at the uh, boot boot table and figure out what the partitions are. Generally, it's going to be pretty simple. You know, maybe a recovery image or whatever, small thing, and then your, your data. But if somebody's trying to hide data, they may have a small partition at the end, they're buried in the middle somewhere, and that's something they're going to look for. They're going to open up your, your log files. If you're on Windows, probably, you know, the, the logs for, uh, for Windows, either the system ones or the user ones. Um, if, if they're looking for specific data, like the case is set up for, they're going to be looking for special certain documents or emails or whatever. And even if those are deleted, delete with your file system, they'll end up with the, um, the re, re, what's the recycle bin. That is easy to recover out of. Even if you um, wipe it, you may not get stuff in a slack space. So just regular delete, even shift delete, you can recover the stuff from back. Recycle bin activity isn't hard to get. There are tools. Um, I haven't played with any. I can't attest to their quality, but there are ways to get that. Obviously, web browsing history, cookies, downloads, those are easy to find if you don't scrub them or delete them. And even if you do, they can often be retrieved. Um, again, there's ways to like say, show me all the MOV files or all the AVIs on this computer. It's a simple, basically, grep, like either through the entire DD image or anything that looks like a file. So Somebody could name a AVI dot zip, so you wouldn't think to look at it. Well, the file header is easily, obviously, an AVI. Yeah. So, so one thing, if, if an investigator finds uh, some incriminating files, they're going to look at the file creation date, the file access date, the file modify date. Then they're also going to try and correlate who was on the computer when those files were created, accessed, and modified. And they'll be trying to correlate that evidence through the log files. Yeah. And that's going to be helpful to their case. And this process, if you ever end up trying to do an investigation, it is to, takes a long, long, long time. It's all very, a lot of times very manual. There are some tools that help you out a little bit. Go ahead. Um, under Windows, there's a, a tool called, uh, I believe it's, or, or there's, there's, a, there's a policy where you can have it, uh, under Unix, they call shred. They'll just run over your file with multiple different crap that's part of the DOD specification. Eraser, DOD, yeah. Well, the no, Goodman code, good, yeah. Goodman code. Like there's actually like a policy, like you can take your oh, policy it doesn't it delete it. It doesn't doesn't put it in the record, it goes over and writes over it like whatever seven times or something like that. In the operating system, so you don't have to get like a third party software. Yeah, it's free. Uh, MT 2002. That's nice. Uh, look into that and try and use that, guys, if you need, if you want to make sure your files go away when you tell them to go away. Um, when I deleted a lot of P3s by mistake off the drives, where the drive layers changed, a 10 minute Google search, a freeware file, and I have all that yeah. in minutes. Yeah, so it's so easy. the recycle bin is yeah, pretty worthless. Anybody has access to be able to do something like that. Yeah. Find a good wipe utility and try and use it. There are ones where you can right click, you know, just right click on, on the file, it's an explorer extension, and just you know, wipe. I think BC wipe is one. I'm sure there's others. Look around. Doesn't it just write zeros to it or something? Zeros aren't good enough. You want either random data multiple times or a zero one zero one over and over and over. But uh, zeros are good for like to keep you know a lot of people from finding things easily. But it's you can do better easily. Go ahead. Yeah, mo most of those ones that do secure deletions. There's actually I think Vic mentioned it. There's a DOD spec that explains the process of doing what they consider yeah. a secure delete. They've got which is you write this way, too. this way. You know, it tells them exactly how to write to the stuff, and most of them implement that. There's certain so. codes that bas basically there's high frequency changes in the disk player and then low frequency disk changes in the disk player. If you're changing zeros to ones really fast you're, and the disk is spinning really fast, you're not going to dig very deep into that magnetic medium. But if you change the zeros to ones slower, like you do 111000, as that disk is spinning, you have a better chance to permeate down in the disk and erase more magnetic poles that way. If that if you read the Gutman Gutman paper or whatever about the Gutman codes, I can't know I don't know how to pronounce the guy's name, but it's really fascinating about how 
the uh, re magnetic uh, mi microscopy image recovery works. False fails in you're in a hurry. This is like this way. You're going to destroy the drive. Thermite. <laughs> if you are worried, rig it up so that if you, you know, put put a put a piece of thermite on top of your drive and make a booby trap. So if you touch something or don't turn off something or whatever, it automatically burns. That old TV show, the screensavers, yeah. when they destroy the drive, the guy on there, passionate, said there's even companies that will. Reconstruct destroyed parts. Yes, it's not. Yeah. It's very good. Industrial strength gauzer, it'll render that disc completely. It's got to be pretty strong, though. Go ahead. I was just going to say that the forensics are improving to a point where we're getting to a point where we can destroy karate. It doesn't need research. In fact, the most recent part of the defense forensics challenge, they sent out items to different people, and it's sort of like a contest. How many of these items can you find? Right. You can still retrieve. They are like a sh hard shredded you know, meat. Burning it is a really good way if you can torch the thing somehow. Well, they're not just like heavy groups and stuff. <laughs> because the heat changes the magnetic properties. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little about NTFS because that's uh, one of the most common things that probably a lot of people here are dealing with. There's tons and tons and tons of file systems and each one's a little bit different and hard to dig into. But um, NTFS is kind of complex, but I tried to um, get into it a little bit because it's pretty common. Um, one thing that uh, NTFS has is something called alternate data streams, which is what happens when, you know when you right click a, a file in NT and you have the, the properties tab where it has the author and the date and the different parts about your Word document or whatever? That is not in the file per se. It's not part of your Word document, but um, it's sort of like the resource fork in the Mac OS old school system and probably they have it too, the HFS Plus. It's a, another part of the file that's strapped on that's kind of sets entirely on its own. This part of the file is not calculated in file size. So one way to store a bunch of data is if you can get a tool to get into that and access that stuff. You can put a ton of data in there and it won't show up as increased size of the file. You have five minutes. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Under, uh, in Unix you can mount a directory on top of another directory and basically all the stuff underneath there, you can't see. Because when you try and access it, you get the one mounted on top. So an old school way of hiding stuff is to put it in a directory and then as root, mount another file system on top of that. And then it all kind of disappears. You won't see it um, in the file system access. You'll just see a big drive. And so lots of wares are stored that way. Stenography, uh, like uh, Vic was talking about yesterday, you can hide stuff in a, uh, in a file. Um, so different utilities, uh, test disk is one that allows you to uh, pull out damaged partitions like uh, the boot table gets messed up. There's a way to recover where the partitions start on the disk by looking at this, the structure of uh, data at those points because you know what the top of a uh, disk partition looks like. Blah, blah, blah. Some other tools, Refuty is one that allows you to Look into the recycle bin. Sleuth kit autopsy is a free source um, tool that will allow you to do all kinds of stuff on NTFS and uh, Unix file systems. Um, Explorer cache can be analyzed. This is a sleuth kit thing. Um, this is a hard to see HTML interface called autopsy to the sleuth kit, which is a number of tools which allow you to inspect at the inode level. Say a file gets deleted, basically what you do is remove the inode link. Well, you can do an ls and find out what the inode is and access that data block directly. Um, some other tools for finding pass passwords on, for instant messaging, there's this one called MessinPass, which you run it on a machine and it spits out all the passwords for different uh, instant messaging utilities. For email, um, whatever the common uh, Windows, Outlook, or whatever, task view and allows you to see what's called protected storage in Windows. Uh, there's stuff you don't even know you're leaving, like EXIF data and JPEGs. I know when you took that picture, if it has GPS data attached to it, where you took it, from what camera. I can detect there's probably a serial number on that picture that tells me that the image on this was taken with the same camera as this one, so you can put the same camera in two different places. Email headers have all kinds of stuff people are worried about. I know people are mining Flickr yep. uh, data. They, 
Well, it's all there. Uh, boring stuff about how a disk is laid out. If you want to try and analyze an image, um, there's a master boot record, and then it tells you where the different partitions are. And this is some of the detail on, you know, the system ID is the specific type of file type. There's tons of different file systems, and each one has uh, all kinds of capabilities. Some have limitations. CFS is monster. Uh, NTFS has gone through a couple different iterations. Uh, since the version 3.5, which is called, also called NTFS 5, we have quotas. Encrypting file system, I'll do a couple slides about that. Reparse joints allows you to put crazy file systems, and when you go to a file system, other things happen. Sparse files is if you have a monster file, but you don't want to take the space because it's all zeros in there. It just takes up the space that has actual data. Journaling means if you shut down the file and then overwrite, it can recover stuff. Ultimate data streams is what I talked about before. Places to put data that you really can't get to from the command line that, you know, properties or whatever it is. Blah, blah, blah. NTFS is really cool by a lot of people's uh, standards. More features, encryption. Um, NTFS is all about metadata, just like Unix is all about files. Everything's in metadata. It makes it easily upgradable, so that's why it's kind of been around so long and gone through these different upgrades. It uses UTF-16, which can make things uh, tough to read back, because if you get a single corrupted byte, it throws off the rest of the character, and you can kind of lose stream sync or something like that. So that's a little bit dangerous. Everything is related to UTC. So um, it's Unix-like in the times. If you see a time and you're doing analysis, it may not be the actual local time of when the file was created. You can link it back to England. Um, the, there's an encrypted file structure, right now, which I don't know a lot about, but it allows you to store files encrypted in Windows. And basically, you have your own key to store something and protect it, but so does the administrator. So it's not worth a whole lot if you don't trust your organization. Uh, basically, you're, you're encrypting with uh, all these Ks, and it's easy to get back because you can just use your K here, but the agent, your boss, can also use a key and pull the data right back out. So it's kind of nice if you're not too worried about things, but... Um, or if you're on, you're on boss. Don't bet. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> That's good. Well, if, if your machine sees and they can uh, get into the admin privileges, then they can get into the admin privileges. Was that zero? Was that zero? What? <laughs> uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't no, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to you, Ori. Right? Yeah, zero. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a couple oh. CDs if you want to go get some now. forensic CDs. This one, Helix, has both a Windows side, a whole bunch of win uh, Windows YouTube tools. You can if you find in it, find a computer that you want to analyze or whatever, you can stick in a disk and it'll allow you to copy the physical memory out of there over the network to somewhere that you can analyze it later. You're, uh, you're obviously messing with the computer when you do that, but it captures everything. It captures swap, it captures the whole physical memory. So anything, passphrases or whatever they're in there, you can get. The Belgian Computer Crime Unit or whatever has this thing called FCCU. This is a really neat disk. Um, it's at this web address if you want to write that down. It's got tons and tons of cool analytic tools and recovery things. If you a friend breaks a drive or says I can't get to my stuff, this one or this one will help you out. When you start it up, if you're not in Belgium, you need to say <laughs> Linux space Lang equals US or else your keyboard won't, won't work. It's like the Nopix thing. There's a whole bunch of other distros. Snarl is a FreeBSD-based one. It's got a bunch of tools. Snop STD is an old standard uh, for analytic stuff. And Backtrack is kind of a pen testing thing. It's got tools. Um, Corners Toolkit is a way to hide things. Use Thermite. <laughs> <laughs> Use TrueCrypt if you're on Windows or Linux and you want to store stuff that is in a file on your disk that you can make a drive that's totally encrypted. TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt. It won't keep stuff out of your registry, it won't keep stuff out of history, but if you want to store files that you don't want anyone to see when they do an analysis, wrap it up in AES and you can use it cross platform. Yeah, you can actually run TrueCrypt on a USB drive and have yes. it run when you put it in right. the machine. You don't have to install machine, it. On machine, you have to have admin privileges because it's going to load and steal out. Yeah. But it gives you a nice local um, encrypted thing. Yeah. 